Remember, this is the camera right here. Okay. And um, comments will appear. Okay. I'm not and we are live. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Anthony Epps. Thank you for joining us. I'm here with uh, Krista Cloutier. 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 Close we, enough. We practiced that five times. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, we're here in Arles, France, uh, the photo festival. Um, I've been coming here for like five years now, doing my workshop, which starts tomorrow. I'm very excited. And Krista was good enough to come uh, meet me and talk about uh, photography and how to sell your pictures. And I learned, we've been chatting for a few hours now, and it's been an absolutely amazing experience. I've looked at many of Krista's photos and kind of like a back and forth um, thing. And uh, it's off to a really good start. It's, it's been really fun. a pleasure to meet you. Really fun. Really excited. So um, I had a few questions for our audience here for you. I mean, we'll do this kind of um, uh, random. Okay. <laughs> Let me just see. Check something here. There okay. we go. While there he checks, is. I'll just say yeah. the reason I can answer questions about photography. Yes. Tell us a little <laughs> about yourself, Krista. <laughs> it's all right. I just thought I would take the moment. Um, I am the founder of theworkingartist.com, and uh, I was for many 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 years an art dealer i worked with a lot of photog photographers particularly i did work um, with painters and drawers as well but photography is really where my heart is it's what i've studied it's what i've done and um, i've sold a lot of it over the years and now i help other artists and photographers to sell their work through theworkingartist.com so, uh, it's a good person a, to know if you're someone like me. <laughs> but as a photographer myself, I've been following Anthony for years and years. This is the first time we've met in person. I'm a huge fan of his work. So this has been a real treat to have a back and forth today. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a pretty special day. It's been a pretty special day for us both. Um, we've got five people watching. Um, hi. hi, everybody. I can't see your name, so... I'm just going to ask, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? And um, if you guys have any uh, questions you'd like to ask, um, just write them down in the comments because I can see those, okay? Um, so, Krista, if you're a photographer, how do you go about selling your photos? What's, what, how, do you, how do you get started selling your photos? I think the most important thing is to look at your body of work and identify what I call the golden thread of your work. What is it that ties them together? You might have... 2,000 really cool shots, but when you want it, when it comes time to selling your photographs, it's not about cool shots. It's about a body of work that says something. Yeah. It has to be technically excellent, and it has to have something to say. And the more you can focus um, on a specific body of work that uh, addresses a particular style or a particular idea, the better. It doesn't mean you have to do that for the rest of your career, but if you want to start selling your work, you have to have some work that's recognizable as yours. Right. And I think that's the best place to start, and then the next step would be to identify an audience for that. Because just because you make work, and it's good work, doesn't mean that everybody in the world's going to want it. So the more you can narrow, again, and focus that audience, the more you can, the better you can create a sales plan. That's pretty good. That that's amazing advice. Is this is this something that's possible for um, amateur photographers, or would you say that you you know if you're an amateur photographer and you don't have a lot of um, background um, in in the art world, is this something that you can? Is it something possible to do? I think so. I mean, the word amateur is a funny word, isn't it? Mm. We really. We think of it amateur as less than, and I don't know if it has to be. I think uh, uh, the difference between an amateur and a professional is someone who gets paid for it, but I don't think that money validates talent. So you can be an amateur photographer and be doing incredible work. So absolutely, if you are an amateur and you want to become a professional and start to sell your work, well, every professional started out as an amateur. They didn't start out getting paid for their work. Yep. So absolutely, an amateur okay. can do this. Yeah, you just got to, and that, that blows into my next question. I'm, uh, what holds most artists back from being able to sell their work? I mean, is, you know, is it something within them or something exterior that holds them back? Confidence. I think holds a lot of artists back, not just confidence in the work, 
Um, in my personal opinion, because I've been in the art business for so long, I've seen a lot of artists want to sell their work and start to sell their work or, or start to make those moves towards starting their work, but they don't understand the business of art. So right. they don't have confidence when they make their approach. They don't have confidence when they show their portfolio. They don't have confidence in their prices. They don't have confidence in their website or in, in their artist statement. So I think if you want to be in business, you have to understand how that business runs so you build the confidence. And same with confidence in the work. You can't just have a bunch of cool shots. You have to really know your craft and know that, believe in your work and have the confidence in it. Confidence is something that a lot of people think that you're born with. Yeah. And some people have it, some people don't. And that's just not yeah, true. I mean, it's it something come, that's earned. It comes, it comes and goes from day to day. It know? does, but As it comes artist, through work, don't right? you think? Yeah. I mean, the more I'm into my work and into my images, um, the better I feel about myself. You know, that I was like, well, you know, I'm actually quite good at this. And I, I get the most confidence when I'm being creative and producing work that makes me feel good. You know, that I can say, oh, this is this is a signature Anthony Epps and, you know, I, I can keep doing this for the rest of my life and, you know, it will always make me feel good. And don't you think that when you're starting a new project, I know I have this, when I'm starting a new project, especially a big project or something that's really ambitious, I have no confidence and then I think, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Oh. But you recognize that as part of, <laughs> it's part of the path. To yeah, getting confidence. It is. If you just stop there, you're never going to get there. That's that's a really good point. We were talking earlier. I was I was ex I was telling Krista when I started my my Paris at Dawn book. I was so intimidated and so unconfident about shooting Paris because it was like the most photographed city in the world. You know, 60 million pictures a year. What am I going to do as a simple photographer to do something original? You know, my my intent was to do something special. Uh, I just like it just seemed like a, a insurmountable order yeah. you know but soon as I started shooting and I started getting my images back and I said like, okay this is what I do and I'm doing it in my way you know I've right. set my intention to photograph uh, Paris in a very specific way a very specific time of day and it's working and it's really good and producing that work gave me the confidence to keep going and it ended up being my at that point in time my favorite project that I've ever done and every time I finish a project, yeah. it's always my favorite. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's always my favorite. <laughs> Hi, Diana. How's how's the reception? Uh, um, is it looking good? Hi, Hi, Denise. Thanks for joining. Hey, if you guys are there, um, uh, say hello so we can see you, yeah? Okay. Um, that was really, really quite insightful. Thank you for that. Um, got another question. Uh, this one is from Diana. Um, my partner and Diana said she's asking what's the most important thing photographers need to know um, about um, selling the work as art right right hi Yvonne from Santiago <laughs> cool very cool okay Di says we're perfect we're good I was there last year yay Santiago yeah. um, the most important thing for a photographer to move into the art world is to understand the art world is a world unto itself. Now, that doesn't mean that a photographer who's selling art photographs in the United States is going to be different than one in England or Bulgaria. The art world is its own world. But it yeah. does mean that a photographer working in the art world is working with different language, different rules, different understandings than a photographer who's working in commercial ventures, right. for example, or in another business. Business doesn't equal business when it comes to art, and commercial doesn't equal art when it comes to art. The art world has its own rules and its own language. So really, again, learning about the business of art I think is a good, the best way for a photographer to move into the art world. And also, um, quality. Quality of the images, of course, but uh, in photography, photography fades. Yeah. So you need to be really, really diligent about the archivalness of the paper that you're printing on, yeah. the inks that you're using. 
your clients who are going to be spending a lot of money on this work expect it to last forever. Tens of thousands of pounds. Yeah, <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> Millions, yes. Let's think big, right? But, I mean, you never know. You yeah. never know. You never know that works that you might start out selling for, you know, a few bucks could end up being worth hundreds of thousands later. That's what we're all working for, right? Yeah. So from the beginning, you want to take care of your quality. You really want to be careful that you're not printing things that are going to fade later right. on. Right. You want to take really, really good care of your prints and treat them like gold. Also, bookkeeping. Keep track of where things are, what they've sold for, who owns them, edition numbers, all of that. I think editions is something, actually, can I I'd talk like to, about I'd editions? I'd like to talk to you about editions. That was, that was a question I was going to ask okay. because <laughs> I, I pricing and editions, we'll do, we'll do that next, right? Okay. So, so let, let us, what's your thoughts on editions? Well. Just explain what an edition is first. Okay. Yeah? With a photograph, as you know, you can make limitless copies of the same image. Hi, Paula. Hi, Paula. Um, <laughs> but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. Because the less there are of that image, the more valuable it is. So an edition of one is going to be worth more than an edition of ten or a hundred. A lot of people like to print really big editions which is fine, but it does bring the value down. Also, you have to remember, you have to sell a hundred of the, that same image. Mm. Myself, I would rather take more images and I would rather have smaller editions. Now, the way I've always sold photographs, uh, if an edition is say an edition of 40, 30 or 40, which is a size that I like, um, every say 10 that sell, I raise the price. So that's a way for me yeah. to control the price. I, I do the same thing. But yeah. Just about 10%, 15%. Yeah. 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 Unless it's selling like gangbusters, then I yeah. can jack it up more. <laughs> <laughs> Put it up 30, 40%. Yeah, that's, that's good marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in addition, has to, every one has to be exactly the same. There can be no difference in an addition. However, here's a trick I learned because I, I used to be an arts appraiser, a valuer. If you have an edition that is sold out, and say it was an 8 by 10 black and white print, mm -hmm. you can print that edition again in a different size. Maybe, maybe now it's a platinum print. Right. It's 11 by 14. That's a whole new edition. So you can actually work with that same image again, but not in that same size and format as before. Like for my latest gallery, I have... Um... My a project I'm putting together now online. I have two sizes for the prints. Okay. And I have an edition of 100, mm -hmm. and it's for an eight by ten print. Yeah, because it's a beautiful print. I want lots of people to have it. Yeah. And it's at a, it's an affordable price. But then I have an edition of five, and they're a meter and a half. Oh wow. You know, so and that the price is ten times as much. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work yet because it's a new kind of pricing model I'm, I, I, I want to try out. Yeah. But, you know, it's two to two editions at very different sizes and very different prices. I like know, it. And different availabilities. Yeah. Yeah, so one's only four and the other one's a hundred. And you might even consider um, different paper. Yeah, you could do that. That's I haven't considered that yet, but sure. Yeah. That's interesting. No, but both papers will be archival and all the prints will be at the highest quality sure. um, at all times, you know. And when, when we say quality, you know, you have to start as a photographer, you have to start with getting a quality image. I don't want to harp too much about the technical aspects of photography, but, um, you know, your files have got to be good quality if you want to have a good quality print. It's taking a, taking a photograph and making that translate into a good print. If you don't have a good quality file, then making a good quality print is going to be really difficult, you know? So that's where the technical expertise comes in in photography, you know? It, it really helps to know your um, technique and your kit and what exactly exposures are going to give you the best uh, quality for a large print, you know? Because an F11, an F16 is probably going to be a lot have a lot more uh, detail than f22, right? Or, or an f1.4 for some lenses. You know, it depends on what lens you're using. I'm getting a bit technical and off the subject. That's but, all right. You know, I'm talking about quality here, and it's really important to know um, what your 
uh, kit is going to produce. Uh, the best quality you can get out of your kit is important when you're going to print. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, hey, do you guys have any questions for um, Krista and myself? Um, go ahead and write them in the comments and we will have them, we will answer them as soon as we can. Well, right away actually. Um, I also wanted to ask you about um, is there anything else you wanted to add about additions? Because we were talking about additions and... No, I think I think we hit it. Yeah. I think that's good. Okay. Additions are just a... It's a way to market photography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you get a painting, it's like a one-off, right? And that's why it can be millions because it's just... It's an original. But with photography, we're not talking about originals. We're talking about something that can be mass-produced. So we increase its value with... The, uh, the scarcity that we, we said scarcity that's with additions word. yes that's a very good word okay is that a question yes this is glasses. from uh Dennis? denise this asks um please dig a little deeper into the subject of body of work or thread there seems to be many ways to look at or construct these themes uh well a body of work is um it's basically a project right I mean if you have a body of work like I say I go to Cuba and I come back with a body of work but it is an unedited body of work it's not yet a portfolio but I consider everything I shot at a location to be a body of work that's how I would look at it and and I think you could take the golden thread that I talked about yeah. maybe a little looser like um, before before we started going live, I was showing Anthony my photographs over that I've taken probably over the past 10, 12 years. So it wasn't necessarily a oh thank you. It wasn't yeah. necessarily a body of work from a specific project. Yeah. Um, but I think from our conversation, you could see a golden thread that tied my work together. Yeah, there was definitely a stylistic trend that was going through her work. And it was it was all based on uh, intention, you know, uh, the feel of the images. You know, these images, would you would look at her work and you would, you would feel a certain way. And as I was going through, you know, dozens of images, I kept feeling this same feeling. You know, it's like, oh, this person is saying the same thing again, you know. And it was shooting with intention. And, that's, and that, that is a stylistic attribute, you know. I think so. And uh, I, I think my intention get... is about noticing. It's like little yeah, little yeah. vignettes, little, you know, just little scenes. Like so ma ma I... mac micro scenes, macro micro scenes, scenes yeah, yeah, you know, that uh, were composed in a certain way. And they were saying, as they were trying to make you feel a certain way. And it, it was successful enough that I could tell it was coming from the same photographer. So coming from the same photographer, there's a golden thread. When yeah. you can find that thread... They can have someone look at your work and say, oh, that's from so-and-so. When I studied the history of photography, one of our final exams was in history, who mm. took that picture. And you All really, right. really had to know your golden thread. Are we back? Are we back? We're back. Sorry, we've got a little bandwidth problem there. Um, we're talking about golden threads and uh, recognizing photographers' work. You were talking about an assignment, you know, to... to to guess the photographer for an unknown work i would love to do that yeah it was very very because <laughs> cool. i know a lot of photographers i'd probably be pre pretty good at it but say you know for example most people know annie Leibowitz. right all right so you could look at a photograph of hers you've never seen before and say that's probably annie Leibowitz, because just, just the, her lighting you yeah. know her choice of subject matter her camera angle all say annie and it and it's unmistakable trademark, you know, of um, of her photography. Uh, Sheila, Sheila asks, um, thank you for your question, Sheila. Uh, you talked about quality of paper and ink. What about best way to frame? Um, best way to frame ign ignore her to keep cost down. Um, did you misspell something there? Because I. I'm not sure that it makes it. Ignore to keep. Oh, maybe the best way to frame the work to keep the cost down. Oh, the best frame to keep. Oh, yeah, that, that best would make way sense. To frame the work. Yeah, well, of course. 
I suppose the most, in order to, right, in order to keep in the cost down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, <Nice and> Denise. <laughs> um, I suppose the best way to do it is without a frame. I know that sounds kind of, uh, uh, yeah. But, you know, uh, flush mounting on, um, like, PVC board is probably the most effective way, you know, flush mounted on the wall. When you start building wooden frames and metal frames and start putting heavy glass in front of it, and you're asking some guy to custom build to his very specific size, that's when, you know, uh, your costs will really start to go up. But if you are framing your work in custom sizes, like, you know, in, in Europe, it'd be A1, A3, right. uh, those sizes, you can get, you know, stock frames that are fairly inexpensive. But if you have odd size work, then you know you're going to need custom frames and it's really going to go up in price you can also visit charity shops for frames i've gotten yeah. a lot of frames at charity yeah. shops really good um and and also if you google like uh innovative frames or creative inexpensive frames people are doing amazing things with other house, household items yeah I, I found some good frames on etsy yeah you know oh, cool. um, there's a lot of a lot of um craftspeople on Etsy that will do custom stuff for really good prices, you know? I mean, a lot cheaper than you would if you went to a custom framer in downtown London, you know, central London. We'll charge you an arm and a leg for the same frame that's not so bespoke. Good question. Yeah. Um, well, do we have any more questions? Is there anything you want to add to um, the talk about? About frames? About, probably not frames. <laughs> well, again, with frames, I think you need to be careful about the archivalness. If you put a photograph on, on a piece of um, cardboard that's not archival, it will fade your photograph. So you want to be really careful about that. You want to make sure that the glass is UV safe yeah. if that photograph is going to be in any kind of direct light at all. So um, these are when it comes to fine art, these are the things we need to think about with these prints. You've seen the fast food places, you know, and the signs that have faded and they're all blue. You know, they're printed with non-archival inks, and what happens is the, uh, the warmer inks get washed out by the sun first, and so you get a blue image, you know, faded. And that will happen to your prints if you don't use uh, UV glass or you don't store it archivally. 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 Archivally, right? So archivally is like putting it in a box um, in a dark place with, you know, rice paper leaves between the prints. Yeah. And they can be stored there for a hundred years and archival not, box. Archival not just box. Any box. <laughs> yes. Acid free. Acid free. Acid free okay. archival boxes. And you know, this stuff can all be found down at your corner art shop because yeah. these guys know, you know, archival is just pretty standard in the art world, you know? Archival materials are really easy to uh, to get anywhere. And when we say archival, it's not some esoteric thing that, you know, you've got to climb a mountain to get. It's everywhere. Right. And all the inkjet printers now, most of them will have archival inks. So you could make an inkjet print. And if you store it well in, you know, in an archival box in the dark, it could last 200 years. Not a problem. There's certain I know a paper, uh, a polyester or ilfochrome paper, which is you print from negatives or um, some labs will do uh, uh, light jet onto these papers that have an archival life of 500 years. And it's a it's a plastic polyester based paper, and it's beautiful. I used to print on it all the time. Um, Diana says, "Okay, she's in a loud place." She said, "Do you have any suggestions of where you can start selling your work? And what would be your first steps?" We kind of covered the first steps, but we can go over that again. So, I mean, you know, where I started first selling my work was um, out of my house in an art colony. We had a yearly kind of art festival and I sold a lot of work out of there and that got me into the taking my work to cafes. You know, I would take a say, uh, my local cafe, I would take a print there. To, I would shoot and have something to, um, sorry. <laughs> and, I, and I would put up my shows in cafes, you know, with a little price, a little name, caption, and I, would make, I can't remember if I sold anything. But from there I went to galleries, you know, I would start taking my stuff around. and. You just kind of progress from there. I'm not saying everybody has to take that path, but that was the path I took. I'm not sure if it was the right one. I mean, and I think it really depends on the work and right. who your audience is. Again, you and know, your confidence, your and your confidence, all and those confidence. things we talked about. But in the beginning, get your work seen, get it out there. Don't be fussy about oh, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. 
It doesn't have to be anything. It has to be somewhere where people can see it. That's in the beginning, you want your work to be seen. You want to get um, feedback. It doesn't mean you're going to plop it up anywhere. But if you're looking for something for a place, look for a place where you think your ideal audience is going to be. And remember, your ideal audience is never, ever everybody. Narrow it down as narrow as it can be. And think about when you're trying to identify your audience, think about what your work is really about. And think about those subjects that you can talk about all day long and how that, how that's reflected in your work. And think about the people who like your work, even if it's your cousin or your neighbor. Don't discount their comments about your work. What are they responding to? Because if they're responding to something in it, that means other people are probably going to respond to that same thing in it. And then try to find more of those people and get your work in front of those people. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's. And if, and if you, you don't know, know where that is, put it online. Start putting your stuff on Instagram, put it on Facebook, and, and ask questions and listen to the answers. Not questions like, what do you think? But questions about, uh, I don't know. For example, I took this picture of a peacock. I'm making this up on live. I shouldn't have started this. Um, I took a question. I took a picture of a peacock at a zoo, and you know, what do you what, what do you think about? I have that photo. <laughs> what do you think about? Um, because I think that blue feathers are magic. Right. Do you think blue feathers are magic? Now you know the people who are responding. Yeah, I think blue feathers are magic. And if there's a lot of people who really like that and respond to it, okay, there's there's something that in your picture that you respond to that other people are. Yeah. I'm not sure it's, it's a great example. It's but. it's about being ready. It's being about being prepared to talk about your work. Yes. You know, when I got into photography, I wanted my work to speak for itself. You know, these are my photographs. Look at them. Aren't they beautiful? What does it say to you? And you, you're like, when you do that, you're asking someone to, to, to look at your photograph and tell you um, what they think of it. You know, but what you want is to... Give people your intent, what the photograph's about, so they can feel something for it. What you are feeling, you want them to feel for your photographs. And um, that was a hard lesson for me when I first started out in the gallery world. You know, I had to, we talked about this earlier, you know, I had to go back to some of my collections and create a dialogue for them because I had none. They were just beautiful collection of a body of work, of beautiful photographs without any kind of dialogue and, you know, a lot of gallerists, all gallerists, will want you to be able to talk about your work. Right, because they need to talk about your work in yeah. order to sell it. And the reason you don't want the viewer to have to talk about your work is, first of all, it's not their job yeah. to tell you what your work is about. That's your job. Um, but also, ooh, most people are afraid. It's scary enough going into most art galleries. People are really afraid to voice their opinion about a piece of work because they're afraid of being laughed at, they're afraid of being wrong, they're afraid of being ridiculed, they're afraid that art is with a capital A up here and they don't have the education or the vocabulary to talk about it. So when you can offer them a little something, it doesn't mean you need to write a book or an essay on what every piece is about, but just a little something that they can grab onto so that you can have a conversation about it that's going to be a huge selling point for you. Yeah. And talking about your work, I agree, is hugely important. But it's also important to listen because that's how you're going to find your audience, not by telling people you're my audience, but by listening and learning who your audience is. Yeah, so true. I wanted to talk one, one last thing. I wanted to talk about pricing. Mm. And, you know, I think as photographers and artists, one of the most difficult aspects of selling your art is like, putting a value on it. What, what, how, do, how do you do that? How do you start saying, you know, this is worth so much money? How does, what, where do you begin? Art is valued by the market. Art is not valued by how cool the image is, how long it took you to make it, um, how much school you've had. It's really valued by the market that you're selling it in. So an artist needs in order to sell their work professionally, an artist needs to understand their market. Who else is doing what you do 
in the area you're working in and you're selling in. What are they selling at? How do they, you know, if they're selling something that is an A4, you know, do A4 to A4. Don't do their A1 prices to your A4 prices. So you've got to like look at the sizes, look at the, um, the mediums, you know, are they doing digital and you're doing digital. So you really want to keep it as close as you can to apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. But the other thing you need to really look at is their CV to compare it to your CV. Because someone who is shown in museums or been in some big galleries, their prices are going to be higher than yours. So you need to make those adjustments for their CV and your CV. And if you've had more shows, then your, your work will be pricier. Yeah, so reputation has something to do with it. I mean, reputation will allow you to increase your prices. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But a market will contain your prices because mm. the market determines the price. Right. People, um, I get these emails all the time from, you know, I, I've inherited all these paintings from my neighbor. No one's ever seen them, but they're really, really good. What's their value? Well, there is no market value there because there's no market for that work. You would have to create a market in order to create the value for that work. So you, you couldn't just put them into, a, into the market and say, fly be free and see what comes out of it? You could, but you would have to start super low. You would really Why? have to introduce them to the market. So I would start out with just a few and introduce them slowly to the market. That's interesting. And also give it a lot of background, you know, with story so that people understand why yeah why this has value why you've got to teach them why it has value um i suppose the art world seems kind of impenetrable to a lot of people you know it's um, it can be quite intimidating uh mm -hmm. going to a gallery like you said mm -hmm. um any suggestions on like approaching galleries i mean if a photographer was starting out and they're an amateur and they've never had a show before but they were confident about their body of work and they've got good reviews from their peers and families and maybe they've sold a few to friends and they wanted to, to go to a gallery. How would, well, how do you prepare for something like that? You invest in that gallery by building a relationship with them. And by building a relationship with them, I mean you go to all of those gallery events and if you're not in the same city, you go as often as you can. Um, you join their social media channels, you like things that they do, you make comments, you share things, you're on their mailing list so you know everything that's happening with them, you get, you get your face known and you get your name known and you do everything you can to support them first before you ask them to support you. Also keep an eye on their submission policies, if they, how do they accept, when do they accept submissions. Mm. You don't want to just show up at a gallery with your portfolio having never been there before. I've done that. <laughs> How did that, that work brutal. out for you? <laughs> it's, it's not a good thing. I didn't even have an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I started The Working Artist. was yeah. because some guy walked into the gallery and when I sent him away, I, was, I had a photo gallery yeah. and he brought in sculpture. And I'm like, dude, it's not even what I do. <laughs> I, I did that a long time ago. That <laughs> was the sure, way the beginning sure. of the career. But you know? he was so... Like, look at me, look at me. He was so upset. And I wasn't mean. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> this isn't really how it's done. But he started to cry. No. He started to cry and he said, I don't understand the art world. I don't understand how to do this. Where can I go for help? And that was actually when I started putting the working artist together. Because right. I couldn't find any resource for him, so I made one. Well, that's a yeah. sweet story. Well, Even though he brought sculpture to a photography <laughs> gallery, you shouldn't feel sorry for someone who does that. <laughs> well, that's the thing is a lot yeah, of artists money. don't realize that yeah. galleries are, are artists too in many ways. Galleries have their own aesthetic. And just because someone sells photography doesn't mean they're right for your photography. Yes, Find out what kind true. of photography they're into because those are the kind of clients they're courting. It's not just photography. So you've really got to make sure it's a good match. It takes a long time to do this research and to make these kinds of connections, but it's an investment well made. Yeah, you know, last year when I started doing research for galleries, I found that in Germany, there were a lot of galleries in Germany, more than any other country in Europe that I found, that fit my work because there was some kind of trending um, aesthetic that was going through Germany that yeah. my work seemed to fit in all these galleries and I was like wow and, and come back to London and 
my work just seems like very fringe in London, but in Germany, in most of the contemporary photography galleries, I was like, I could be there, you know, I could be the next show after this photographer. And, you know, that gave me the, the verve to call them up and make appointments and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So it did take a lot of research and a lot of time, but, you know, it's going to be worth it. And make sure they're photography galleries, not paint <laughs> galleries. <laughs> yeah. I had a long list of all these galleries in Germany, and then I had to cut it down to a third because they were just the ones that did contemporary photography. Um, hi, Catherine. Uh, good to see you again. Catherine's my old assistant. She's oh, cool. fab fabulous. Did you have another baby, Catherine? I think you had another baby, didn't you? I saw baby pictures on Facebook. Um, any last questions, guys? We're going to wrap it up here. Um, any last questions for myself or Krista? <clears throat> well, thank you, Krista, for um, stopping by Arl to come see me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we've had a really good day. Um, might go see some shows now. Yeah. Oh, some of my students have just showed up. And um, see some fabulous photography. Um, thank you for watching. Um, I guess we say bye now. Go make great pictures. Go make great pictures. Lots and of them. Confidence. And oh, great to hear you, Krista. Okay. Thank you, Di. Thank you, Yvonne, for uh, watching. Um, I'm glad you found it helpful. Thank you. Look at that. All yeah. caps. <laughs> I'm glad you liked the show. It was a lot of fun. We were looking forward to it today. Um, and remember, and also as an artist, it's not who you know so much, it's it, who knows you. Yeah? Oh, great, yeah. You like that? I like that a lot. Yeah. I didn't make that up, but I've been, that's been in the back of my head for many years, decades now. It's who knows you. You've got to get your name out there. You've got to get your face out there, and your work will follow. But you, as an artist, have to be the trailblazer for your work. Okay? All right. Uh, fantastic show. Thanks. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye.